so good morning everyone at the outset i would like to thank aios for giving me this opportunity i'll be basically covering pentacam and corvus briefly so with the evolution of diagnostic modalities in refractive surgery it has helped us in making perfect decisions and reducing the and avoiding the complications currently our decision on choosing the procedure is predominantly dependent upon corneal tomography and its biomechanics. Uh, Pentacam, which is a corneal tomographer, helps us to uh, measure the corneal structure or morphology, whereas Corvus, uh, it measures the corneal biomechanics as tells us about the corneal strength. So, uh, let's come to the Pentacam. So, Pentacam is an elevation-based system. It's a corneal tomographer, which is based on Scheinflug principle. Uh, it has two cameras, the static camera, which lies in the center, and the Scheinflug camera, which rotates and records 50 scans in 20 seconds, just me measuring the 1,38,000 true elevation points. The rotating Scheinflug camera ensures a short examination time and a 3D view. So, these are the models of Pentacam available. The Pentacam HR, which is the professional model, measuring the corneal tomography. The Pentacam AXL, which measures tomography as well as the biometer and Pentacam AXL wave which is a optical biometer and a abrometer in addition. So this is what a normal scan looks like. It gives us the axial curvature, anterior elevation, posterior elevation and the pachymetric map. Here are the demographic details. On the left hand side are all the indices required for to read in the map and to evaluate whether the map is normal, suspicious or abnormal. The scales are very important. It can be a normalized or a standardized scale. Uh, standardized or absolute scale has a fixed diaprick increment helps in comparing scans. Whereas a normalized scale, it can have, we can uh, change the increments of the diopters. So this is the Bell and Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia display. It shows the elevation mapped with standard BFS uh, calculated over a fixed optical zone of 8 mm. Then the elevation map with enhanced BFS wherein uh, we exclude the data. It excludes the data from 3.5 to 4 mm uh, centered around the TCT and helps us to accentuate the abnormal areas. This is the difference map. This is the CT, uh, CTSP or the corneal thickness patial profile which gives the progressing thi uh, progressive thickening from the thinnest point to the periphery along 22 concentric circles. We have the PTI which is percentage increase in thickness from thinnest point to periphery and uh, it should be within the central line or the upper and the lower black lines which indicate 95% confidence limits. So this is BADDI2 which is a multivariate index that essentially gives a clinician a comprehensive global view of the cornea. It has parameters that denote the standard deviation from the mean normative database and it is a combination of pachymetric and curvature data. Uh, recently, BAD3 has been introduced which incorporates KMAX uh, anterior elevation at the thinnest point, posterior elevation at the thinnest point and the ART max into uh, the BAD2. So, uh, how do we read a map? So, firstly, the quality uh, QS or the quality of the map, then the KMAX coming to the TCT, then we need to see the uh, Q value. Then the TCT, we need to see the Y coordinate should be less than 0 point, minus 0 0.5. We need to see the difference between the manifest and the topographic cylinder. Then coming to the axial curvature maps, we need to see whether uh, this round, oval and symmetric bow tie, therein the K-max should be less than 47.2. Whether it is a superior steepening, inferior steepening, if it, there is superior steepening, it should be, the difference should be less than 2.5. If inferior, it should be less than 1.5. Whether there is any skewing, it should be less than 22 degrees. And whether there is any abnormal type of uh, whether it is butterfly, crab claw or vertical D. Then we need to see the elevation elevation maps. Anterior should be less than 12 and posterior should be less than 15. Uh, on, the anti, uh, on the anterior elevation, it should be less than 12 and on the posterior, it should be less than 15. The difference should be less than 5. Then we need to see the pachymetric maps. Uh, and we need to see, uh, it is important to see whether the anterior elevation, posterior elevation and the TCT, uh, do they coincide or not? If they do, then it indicates a suspicious map. We also need to see the inter eye corneal asymmetric score. Now, these are the other maps available on the Pentacam. It can be a comparative map, ABCD or topo topographic staging, the densitometry, the true net power map, the EKR map, the refractive power map, the corneal wavefront map and the three-dimensional anterior chamber analyzer. Now coming to the corneal biomechanics or the Corvus ST, it's an old non-contact tonometer. The real time, it gives the real-time description of the corneal deformation and the biomechanical property. It has a Scheinflug camera with a UV-free 455 nm uh, blue light. It gives 4,300 4, frames per second and it uh, gives out a metered collimated air puff that deforms the cornea and the range of measurement is 1 to 60 uh, millimeters of mercury. The Corvus maps include the dynamic corneal response, the Vinciguera screening report, the CBIT 
PBI map and the biomechanics comparative display. So this is the dynamic corneal response. It has nine stages and the most important that we need to look into is the A1 velocity, the DA ratio, the SP1 or the stiffness parameter and the inverse radius uh, max that is maximum inverse radius. Uh, the next one is the Vincigira screening report. Uh, the things that we need to look into is the SSI curve, uh, which is uh, which shows the intrinsic elastic properties of the cornea. Normally, it should be equivalent to one. If less than one, it indicates a softer cornea. More than one indicates a stiffer cornea. Uh, BIOP is extremely important because it is biomechanically corrected IOP and it is independent of age, the corneal thickness and the corneal biomechanics. The next one is the deformation uh, uh, deformation ratio it in, it includes both the deflection and the eye movements due to the air puff then the integrated radius which is area under inverse uh, concave radius curve the more the area the softer the cornea then the uh, ambrosial relational thickness to the horizontal profile which uh, which indic uh, which includes pachymetric thickness divided by the pachymetric progression and the uh, this uh, is adjusted air pulse, uh, pulse minus this is basically the stiffness parameter which is adjusted air pulse minus the BIOP upon uh, divided by the deflection amplitude. So the more the value, the better the stiffness and the better the biomechanics. So this is the uh, corneal biomechanical index, uh, which uh, is a logistic regression formula. It includes everything into one. And if the values are less than uh, 0 0.25, it indicates low risk. Between 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, it indicates moderate risk. And more than 0 0.5 indicates a high risk. So it uh, the uh, new uh, the TPI incorporates the tomographic as well as the biomechanical index, and it's considered to be more sensitive and specific in diagnosing patients with suspected ectasia or frank ectasia. So this is an approach uh, that we use in our uh, institute uh, to decide a surgery. Uh, group 1 includes patients with normal tomography and normal biomechanics. Group 2 with a normal tomography but borderline biomechanics. Group 3 with a borderline tomography but a normal biomechanics. And group 4 with an uh, abnormal tomography, abnormal biomechanics and abnormal TBI. So how do we apply it? In group 1, we can go ahead with any of the surgeries depending upon the clinical examination, diagnostic reports, surgeon's preference and patient's preference. In group 2, we check BIOP, stiffness parameter and the scan quality. If BIOP is normal, stiffness parameter is low, we go ahead with fakey KIOL. BIOP normal, stiffness parameter is more, we go ahead with either Smile Extra or PRK. If both are low, we see the scan quality. If the scan quality is good, we go ahead with uh, either a fakey KIOL or a PRK. If scan quality is poor, we repeat the scans. In the third group, we, for a well, uh, good quality and a well-centered scan and a normal epithelium, we can go ahead with fakey KIOL or a PRK. But if the epithelium is abnormal, it is considered to be correlating to the body line bad D. We treat the ocular surface, we look for six months, we repeat the scans and then plan a LASIK or a smile. If the scan quality is poor or the angle ab uh, alpha, alpha is abnormal, we re-evaluate, recenter and then go ahead. So for the uh, fourth group with the abnormal biomechanics and abnormal tomography, we go ahead with the fakey KIOL implantation. Thank you for the patient listening. That was a very tough job to cover both. Uh, yes. Pentacam and Corvus in five minutes, but I think you did an excellent job there and in including the algorithm for treatments. Thank you, sir. Uh, just want the audience to know uh, what are the fallacies of the Pentacam, whether you can take the reports on face value or what you should be aware of. So the first thing is the scale. We need to see the scale. The second thing is if the patient is having a haze, then there might be a possibility that it might overestimate or underestimate the K values. That is more most important. Uh, on the, uh, in such cases, an anterior segment OCT dependent uh, tomography will be much better. It will also uh, give uh, faulty pachymetric thickness. Uh, I just wanted to you to explain the specificity and sensitivity of the pentacam. So uh, it require the three readings are to be taken, and uh, if three readings are what is, what is the sensitivity and what is the specificity? So. The sensitivity of the pentacam is just about 67% and uh, specificity is about 97%. So the pentacam has a tendency to overdiagnose keratoconus. Yes. So if it says it's keratoconus, a borderline keratoconus, in about 33% of patients, it can be normal. But, it, but suppose it says it is normal, then it's less than 3% chance that it is abnormal. So if the pentacam, the bad D says that it is normal, then it is highly likely that 
the topography is normal, very unlikely that it has keratoconus. But if it says that it's borderline or has keratoconus, there's a 33% chance that it can be normal and still it's overdiagnosing the keratoconus. So this is something you should be aware. That's one of the fallacies of the Pentacam AS based OCTs are uh, better like the MS39. Yeah. The other aspect is the angle kappa, which kappa. you'll have to look yeah. at. Uh, because angle, if in large angle kappa, you can get skew. Yes. And yes. when you have skew, then it kind of uh, over diagnoses like diagnosis. keratoconus, where there may be no keratoconus. So you should look at the angle, angle alpha, alpha when you're looking at skew. These are two things with the pentacam that you should be yeah. aware of.